Oh, let's see. All right. So again, Dr. Cross wanted me to convey that he's sorry he's not able to make it. He absolutely loves this stuff. And in his typical fashion, he wrote me notes so I don't abble it and do Dave things. <laughs> so, um, so what we're going to be talking about today um, is a little bit on the background of what it takes to get DSI projects running, challenges they run into, compliance challenges. Um, I know a little bit about the background of their projects. So to kick it off, maybe we'll start on the far end and just introduce yourself a little bit about your project, and then we'll go from there. All right, fantastic. So hey, everybody, my name is Casper. And I'm the founder and CEO of a project called Amino Chain. And what we are building is a decentralized protocol to connect biobanks together. So to streamline biosample exchange, to let donors track and see where their samples go, and to have some sort of benefit sharing mechanism for whenever those samples are commercialized or sold. Hi, everyone. My name is Johnny again. Um, I'm also actually on the Amino Chain uh, team, but I'm also... Uh, one of the core developers or core members at DSI World. And we run or develop a platform for knowledge chain logistics, knowledge supply chain logistics. So how do you prove knowledge is being created? How do you evaluate it? And then how do you disseminate it in a way that it's interoperable with both legacy academic institutions as well as, in, uh, I guess, corporate players to drive that level of innovation? And I'm Israel Mirsky. I'm a co-founder of PharmaDAO Pharma Collective. It has two names because... Uh, the words DAO scare people who are outside of the crypto ecosystem, and we have to deal with normies on a regular basis. Um, we are essentially a uh, an approach to funding projects that are uh, focused on uh, improving human health um, uh, from a, a fully sustainable perspective. You can think of us as an investing entity in um, development projects, especially uh, addressing drug shortages and uh, drug repurposing. So with that whole theme, and we're going through the project, this maybe we can start with you. When when you're getting information and you're having to deal with PII for people's, people's disease state and treatments, how do you handle the collaboration you're looking for when you have consents from the individual, but from also consents from industry and how that comes together? Uh, it's challenging. Um, it, the, the good thing for our entity is the way we work is we take proposals from for-profit, uh, CDMOs and small pharma companies that are interested in doing these types of projects. Some of them, some of them we have very strong relationships with, and those entities are responsible for managing, um, those challenges. Mm -hmm. But, um, for them, it's a significant issue. And we spent a lot of time thinking about how to reduce costs in clinical trials, mm -hmm. um, because of course we want to stretch our dollars as far as we can go. Um, and, uh, uh, adherence costs, patient acquisition costs, and the, the costs around, uh, maintaining the consent data, as well as, uh, just documenting that the, the trial is occurring in a, in a, a appropriate way are, uh, pretty significant. So, yeah. 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 We, and earlier when we were talking about cost coordination and compliance, it's always that challenge that we're always those three tenants, but Casper, maybe you could share a little bit about the coordination, because I know you're doing a lot of things globally, you run into the same challenges Remedy runs into, maybe you could share how you're handling those. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I think the first thing that's most important to understand in the United States, um, under 45 CFR part 46 of the OHRP's regulations, if you have donated biosamples and you de-identify them, de-identifying means remove 18 identifiable HIPAA markers, then it's essentially free game. Right, So people are allowed to legally sell those, commercialize them, use them on other studies and do not require consent. And that's a big problem, right? Like if you have a history of consenting, right? From 1979, we had the Belmont report and that was basically an outline of the ethical frameworks for which we want to engage people into research. And the, the founding pillars of that were beneficence, justice and respect for autonomy. And out of that came this idea of informed consent. And conformed consent since 1979 has been the gold standard of, you know, getting people involved into studies. But the world has massively changed since 1979, especially in the world of biobanking, right? So we now have an abundance of genomic data. We have 10,000 at least biobanks in the States. And the consenting frameworks are only ever trying to fix what's the, the problems that the institutions are facing, mm -hmm. right? So we, we come up with broad consent. We come up with tiered consent. We come up with IRB waivers of consent. And at no point have we ever actually thought about, you know, trying to 
embrace emerging technologies to really hit those founding principles of the Belmont report, mm -hmm. keep people engaged and ethically use the samples more than once. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's, I think what we definitely want to build a platform for, we call it demonstrated consent mm -hmm. and make, you know, the, the research participation experience a lot more demonstrable, mm -hmm. let you track where the samples go, see how they're used and have an engaging experience with that. You can use tokenomics if you want, you can, you can, you know, have other, other plays to get involved. But the idea is we're really hitting a big inflection point at the moment right. right? where informed consent just isn't cutting it anymore. And also HIPAA isn't cutting it yeah. and people are coming increasingly more identifiable. So as a matter of fact, I would say we have some kind of regulatory tailwind to that extent because the next iterations of HIPAA will be something more aligned with GDPR yeah. where you have to know what's happening with your stuff and you have to be able to opt out at any given moment. Jelani, yeah. yeah. what are your thoughts? I agree. I think I want to double tap on Casper's point of a lot of the inst a lot of the frameworks that currently exist are facing the institution. And to your point previously, the hardest part of clinical trials is recruitment, right? Recruitment, to your point, costs that are associated with those. How do you can maintain engagement? And so we need to create frameworks, and that's part of the opportunities with Web3 that are more facing towards the patient. So demonstrated consent is one. Frameworks that allow patients to participate through use, through easier interfaces, and then wrapping in additional information that people can attest to themselves through different frameworks, whether it be proof of knowledge or design nodes or some of the others that were uh, presented, are kind of a tripartite mix of technologies that I think allow for patients to feel more engaged in the process. And I think those are things that we really need to double down with. One of the things that we're seeing in market recently, and since, since the 23 and Me situation everyone could go read about it it's it's almost at a point where you mentioned that you're running on a protocol oh you're doing crypto i'm like i'm not cryptocurrency I'm date time stamp globalization traceability kind of kind of stuff what how what do you see as a pro and a con coming out of the 23 and me situation such as visibility awareness you know fear of market what what, what are your thoughts casper yeah, so I think for me, I came across a very interesting quote one time, and it was basically the idea of the trade-off between rationality and liberty. And the idea right now of why we have IRBs to consent people into studies, right, and why scientists are the ones to decide what they do with the samples and decide the unmet need and so on, is this idea of rationality, right? We're the PhDs, we have the expertise, we understand what's best, we're the bioethicists, and therefore, you know, if we gave everybody too much liberty, and they could dynamically say yes or no on a case-by-case -case basis of what happens with my samples and my data, we're going to slow down research output, right? And so I think that is now no longer a rational explanation, right? And we are now building technologies to swing things more towards a liberty scale. Mm -hmm. But if we really want to hit a sweet spot of keeping people engaged and respecting autonomy and you know, self-rights with the maximum research output, we do need to find a barrier in which we can entrust scientists in right times and keep people informed in the right times. And the biggest part of that is going to be communication of what actually happens with their samples and how those are used. And 23andMe did that terribly, right? So they, they clearly did not communicate that at any point. Um, that is now super, super obvious. And so the next iteration will be a 23andMe-like company where people are really fully informed about the secondary use of what's going on with their samples. Yeah, Israel? Uh, I was just going to say, you know, if <laughs> there's there's two elements to the impact of 23andMe, right? The first is the uh, impact on public opinion and public concern around data usage in the health space. And the other is what's the regulatory impact? And there's, of course, a relationship between the two, but they're, um, they're not the same thing. And um, if GDPR is any indication, there uh, is probably a decent amount of elasticity to the number of catastrophes that can happen. Um, before regulatory really kicks in in a significant way and fixes the privacy issues. So I think it's probably going to take a little while longer. Um, and I think while like 23andMe made the point for anybody who is paying close enough attention, that's not most of the public. Um, they don't care. It's it's not something that that enters their their ken. So you know I'm 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 not expecting to see extremely swift movement. I could be wrong, but um, that's my perspective. You know, you hit on an interesting point. In, in this industry, there are established guardrails that if we're going to be successful, we have to stay within. We can talk about, you know, people want to go sell their own data. It, it's just not going to get adopted in the industry. It's, it's, it's a mute point. We can look at the value from that visibility and awareness is a huge part of it, especially with some of the AI stuff going on and understanding 
prescriptive authority, a medical review officer at work of what they're finding. You know, uh, you can do a diagnostic test at home, you get a result, it'll tell you, but it's really not until it's reviewed by a medical doctor to still license. So there's still the regulatory guardrails. Johnny, what are you seeing in, in, in your thoughts of how AI models on top of this distributed data set can accelerate discovery, but then you still have the traditional guardrail barriers of adoption. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, that's definitely where the space is going. Uh, AI assistance across a variety of verticals are going to be essential how we operate with the data space, with the data sphere. Um, and to that end, I think we need to create better railways or better streetways equivalent to the Roman road system that allow us to devise to make data sets available to AIs in a way that is privacy preserving. And we have examples here of platforms that do create that. But I wonder if the issue is going to then become the adoption with the doctors, like with that level of, uh, with the actual institutional players who want to leverage these. What do you think? You mean, uh, like, Sorry, define that a little more because I think you could be going in a couple of different ways with it. So in the direction of we can create road systems that allow for data to be not monetized, but packaged and inform LLMs, right? right to create domain experts in the field where you don't right. necessarily have to go to a doctor, but the doctor is assisted by uh, an agent. Right. But what is the propensity of you think doctors being amenable to being to assisted by these agents? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think, um, We've already seen examples of AI models that are performing better than radiologists, yeah. for instance, right? And so that's that's certainly frightening for radiologists. Absolutely. Um, but I think that the the reality is that health systems are going to make those decisions um, because if the AIs are better than the doctors at doing the diagnosis and it saves them money, um, then they're going to use the AIs first. Um, and I think we're we are staring down a a, a current state where that is going to start happening. Agreed. Um, and so just, just because it's again, look at the financial incentive, right? So, um, I, I think that's going to drive significant change relatively rapidly. So do you think the precipice of precision medicine in the case where, you know, it's not a generalized prescription, but I go and Shadi comes to the doctor and he needs very detailed information, right? The level of care or the level of scale of attention in that realm would necessitate assistance that it go beyond the actual physical doctors being a part of it. So I think the advent of pre precision medicine from the perspective of needing to understand data and the comprehensive aspect of data that exists around you, in addition to the agents that can then help with that is what's further gonna precipitate that, that shift in the paradigm. I think we're gonna see AIs as primary, like first line diagnosing entities. You think? Um, yeah, oh yeah, real fast. And then backed up by medical doctors as like a second line of evaluation, but they're going to start rubber stamping this stuff because it's going to be better than them pretty fast. So Dr. Cross and I do a lot of work up on the Hill from a lobbying perspective. Um, we will say this, it all goes back to your payers. So ICD-10 codes and CPT for you don't know, that's how people get paid. Kaiser Permanente, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all that type of stuff. In a multi-payer system in the US, it's completely different. And Casper, I'm dying to ask from your perspective in Europe, it's just, it's just different. So there's not a threat to someone's livelihood that is in the U.S. by the model that seems intuitively correct, but it could it be adopted in other markets? Yeah, I mean, that's a really fascinating point for sure. So, I mean, uh, for context, I'm like originally from South Africa, but then grew up in the U.K. and London. And I mean, you guys may or may not know over there, they have a national health service, right? The NHS. And that is, it's, it's hugely centralized and it's great because it's free, right? But I mean, it's hugely, hugely, hugely inefficient. So in a slightly more privatized mark, health, healthcare market like you have over here in the States, reimbursements just happen faster and therefore innovation happens faster. So the NHS has got top quality doctors, but you'll be on a wait list for a transplant. I guess you're on a wait list for transplant anywhere, but wait list for a surgery for a super long time, up to six years, something relatively basic within the NHS. So they could definitely use AI based toolings and diagnostics a lot more maybe than folks over here would because they're so bureaucratic and slow and inefficient. But I think it's going to be slow to adopt that because they've just got too much top down decision making to make. I think one of the most interesting aspects of AI is going to be its potential to eliminate bureaucratic positions, yeah. including in medicine, right? Like a, a lot of that of the reason that there's such a long wait is because of all this intermediate administration and paper pushing. And like, we are staring at an asymptotic improvement curve on artificial intelligence. Like whether or not you believe that it's actually intelligent, 
it's the emergent level of ability to analyze and suggest reasonable outcomes on data are, I mean, they're got to be getting close to some of these bureaucrats at this point. And, and, and I think the real question is going to be like, when does the liability involved in using them um, uh, outpaced by the value of applying them? Mm. There's a so, question out here. I'd love to. Yes. So I would I would submit to you that I think the number of times when the trolley when the trolley problem, as we pronounce it here, um, is is actually in operation is a lot smaller than the number of times that the decision making process is much more about like it, it is a purely bureaucratic decision. Right. So so what I'm saying is I, I think I think that for a while it's gonna be human beings whenever actual human lives are involved and you're trying to make those kinds of moral judgments. But I think we're also going to have to start systematizing our answers to those trolley problems at a societal level, like a lot quicker because we're we're because it's now possible to begin to apply them in this way. Well, given the prevalence of uh, uh, of um, what's the the there are a lot of doctors who would qualify as psychopaths. Um, so, <laughs> I like to do so, disclaimer. So, note like, right if there. if we're really if we're really serious, you really want uh, uh, academic ethicists to be the ones who are making those decisions and not doctors. I mean, just look at the at the poor pain pain management for non-white people in countries around the world, um, and the prejudice there. Like, I I don't trust doctors to effectively answer that particular question as much as I would trust an ethicist. It, you know, as we continue to pull all this back together, just kind of where we, where we started, it'll put a, wrap, a bow around it a little bit. It has a lot to do with the fact, if you go to Quest Diagnostics, you get a pregnancy test, you go to the hospital, what's the first thing they do? They charge you for another pregnancy test and it goes to the same damn lab, okay? That's the reality. It all goes back to monetary models that are established that cause challenges with all that. The right decision is not gonna get implemented in the way that our system is set up and those are within those guardrails. So where do you find those fissures where you can bring innovation and start to change the paradigm because the healthcare industry is challenging? You ask the AI. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just noticed we got time for a couple more questions. Anybody else with some thoughts? Please. Yeah. So one question that I have that's kind of been coming up on my plate recently is all around the usage of data lockers, data visiting, kind of this compute over data concept, and how privacy and permission can be handled in a programmatic fashion, mm -hmm. uh, so that in any given data locker, obviously, whenever someone sets their level of permission, and level of permission may not be the right way to go, I'm not an expert on that, but whenever <laughs> someone sets it, first off, that metadata can be accessed so that any agent can know, yes, we can run on this specific yeah. data locker on the client side and then aggregating those results back. And I'd also be curious to hear y'all's thoughts around some of the security concerns mm -hmm. of allowing distributed client side computation. That's what we're medical data. That's some thoughts. Anyone, John? Do you want to go? Oh, you go first. I haven't. So, so if you're if you're interested in a non decentralized, at least for the moment, solution, come talk to me after. I know a company. Um, you know, I think uh, the AI models talk earlier actually had an interesting looking stack for some of those types of questions. But um, yeah, ultimately, I, I don't think it's a a solved problem yet. But I think we're very close. So I can tell you what we do in the remedy world. If I get a, a row of data, so we actually take each individual 
a data element and put a digital signature around it. Think of the old school codex on a, on a CD. So that every data point stands alone and the transaction ID that resolves on the subnets is how you decrypt. So I can permission every data element. Is it a PII element, PHI, or is it a collaborative element? And it has three different decryption algorithms. That's what we submitted to the FDA. So there's a tokenization submission to the FDA that a large pharma company co-authored with us exactly about how that is being done. So the regulators are talking about it as a solution hit market. You know, we, we got a lot of guidance from the FDA. So we're very fortunate in that piece because you, you, you have to align with the regulators. You just have to, or you just, it, it just puts, you can't push rope to the FDA. Are you speaking from a specifically health context or more generalized data access context? Yeah. There's just there's so many like HIPAA specific regulations that like if you're if you're working in a health space like it really helps to have somebody who's also working specifically in a health context. Um, yeah. Yeah, but you're you're running into the same while others are. Yeah. Any other questions? I thought it was another hand, maybe. Or solicit another question from this side of the room, four rows back, in a hat, maybe. Got to look at a guy. All right, there we go. Winner, winner. Yep. Yeah. Um, are you guys excited about using technology within Web3 that can help prove the UX for uh, embedded consent or consent by default uh, within? And there's three three types of consent, just to clarify. So if you sign up for something, you've got some questions. You also have something called AOE questions. Do you have a pre-existing condition related to the service code you're going to be doing? And then there's once you're being diagnosed, there's another set of questions, understanding it, and there's legal ramifications, and, and all three are unique. So I just want to clarify, and the way they're handled is different, especially in the EU. Yeah. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah, so um, very quickly in our context, right? If it's, you know, you're donating a biopsy sample that's part of a non-diagnostic protocol, right? So it's like remnants after a surgery, and then somebody comes up to you and says, hey, can we keep this for scientific research? Right now, the consent rates at major institutions are super low. There's low as 25%, right? And the people that don't donate are the ones that represent the biggest unmet medical needs. So from marginalized communities and patients of color particularly, right? It's a case in South Africa, like where I'm from, and of course here as well. And um, right now, what we're saying is that informed consent isn't, isn't really cutting it, right? Because even if they donate it to one biobank where they do this type of research, you're still inundating them with information on one piece of paper. And it's super hard to actually build a narrative in someone's head then and to you know make them understand what really is going to happen with their donated sample. So of course, consent rates will be low. Of course, the mistrust is super high. And so what I'm super excited about, um, we're building in some ways, but so many other amazing projects are building as well, is a way in which you can flip the model on its head and actually have bioethics be a driver of your business model. So you can go to the individual and say, look, we want to take your sample. We want to distribute it as far as possible to generate as much knowledge as possible first and foremost, for your benefit, and then secondary for scientific research benefit. But we want to do that safely. So why don't you give us your terms and conditions of how we can do this? And you could tick box it in some ways. You could say, no, I want to make it dynamic. Ask me on this case or this case. You can say it's totally broad. You can go wherever. And either way, you can put all of those parameters of consent, maybe as metadata of an NFT that represents a sample, and then in very simple terms, an NFT marketplace where anybody can buy that token and only if it's um, in line with the consent that was given, right? And the whole time the donor can see where it goes. And so the personalized consent that they gave is a bit more demonstrable. What do you think an individual bio sample on average is worth? Uh, it totally varies. It, it, like it I'm sure it does, but yeah. like, like order of magnitude. All right, okay. So if you had a plasma sample that could maybe go for around 200 bucks, a whole blood sample or like a whole pint of blood would go for around 500 to 800. That's per client or across the whole corpus? Um, we'd like all for, possible clients. All possible clients. Yeah, so, yeah. all possible clients. And yeah. then uh, if you go down to like cell lines, you're talking $4,000 per, per vial. 
you go up to one cubic centimeter of hematopoietic stem cells, so 34 uh, CD positive cells. Uh, if you go to an allogeneic graft of stem cells, so somebody that's giving that to a donor, that's $40,000, which the nonprofits are cost recovering on. So, you know, be the match out there earning half a billion in yearly revenue selling donated samples, kind of unethical. Um, and, and yeah, so these things can massively vary. Uh, that's real money. It's huge. Uh, donated blood products alone is a $34 billion market, right? The Red Cross had a $1.2 billion like annual revenue stream and doing what? Right, saving the world? No, I feel like there's a lot of marginalized communities that could really benefit from this. That's exactly what we're saying. Right. Another question over here. I mean, it's, let's be honest, guys. Like, I, so uh, stepping back to GDPR land, you can de-identify somebody with a very small number of bits of data. <laughs> like, it really doesn't take that much. So the idea that we're going to be able to share all this health data and it's not going to be possible to cross-reference and re-identify people to their samples, it, it's probably not true. We're probably living in a world where that's going to be possible and we just have to make it as illegal as possible and drive enforcement against that issue. Um, so from that perspective, the quantum access is perhaps less relevant. It'll be possible regardless. It's possible now, but um, I think you just, you have to prosecute people who do it. And, and there are quantum resistance exactly. sharing options that like, it's not just our problem to solve, right? You can build quantum the entire resistance. financial system is worried <laughs> about that. But, yeah, but you can also build quantum resistant frameworks into existing blockchain architecture, right? So for those of, that exist, like currently, whether it be uh, running on, on Avalanche or any of the other different subnets, there are active teams that are right now working on it. So I don't, I'm not too sure that's going to be much of a big and issue. The FDA, the federal government just put a $135 million quantum compute grant into the Southeast where we're located. There's 15 million given directly to South Carolina from the governor's office to discuss those aspects of it. Uh, digital innovation has been a big key in the Southeast for, from that perspective. So th the funding is there for it. People are looking to identify it. But the point to take away is everyone's heard of ISO 9000. It's a great process qualification that every company like ours has to have. It, all it says is you just you do a process the same way every time. It doesn't say it's a good process. It's not a good, bad process. It's just to do the same shitty thing the same way. So the regulations can't say, is it right or wrong to re-identify or not? Is it legally, is it illegal? Yes, but there's still the, the, the criminal aspects of that. But it takes literally, it's five data elements. You can go across any EMR on the planet and re-identify it. It's, it's five elements. It's nothing. So, yeah. Just so the, the Avalanche group, there's some hyper EVM work they're doing related to the ZK side of it that we're actually running on top of the compliance engine, but they're trying to, it's really hard to get as full as you think you could and uh, not run into the same thing. If, if you're smart, you can go buy utility data all day long. Yeah, we run 15 validators and we're talking our clients into running their own validators. That's that's exactly part of the sales process that we have to do to get adoption. You're right on point. Yeah, that first one I had to run myself. Yeah, that sucked. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, one more question. Then we, then we got to wrap up. I think it might be sad. Yeah. How do you deal with right to bring up blockchain? I can tell you how we do it. And we only we store two things on on public protocols. We've got to the subnets now. It's the it's the hash that's generated by the transaction proof and um, some metadata that says this was a trial. This geographic area maybe it's Hep C. So if you break the platform key that allows you to start taking the metadata and tying it to the transaction, that's how we can remove it in theory. 
It's the same way in the old days, they're like, you want to go delete a hard drive. You didn't really delete a hard drive. You just broke the sector and the pointers. So the game is for us from regulatory perspective, we broke the pointers and then taught the FDA. We did the same thing as delete for the last 20 years, but it was a huge legislative effort on our part to get that. But that's how we did it. Yeah. So, I mean, an our system, we have a distributed node architecture. So each biobank runs what we call an amino node. And this is not a, you know, layer one validator node or anything. It's more like a chain link node. So it's something that has a blockchain wallet inside of it and they run on their own servers and it connects to um, everything Web3 related and it integrates with their lab inventory management systems and all the normal stack of the biobanks and the, and the labs. And so um, all PHI is kept off-chain self-custodial within the biobanks on top of their SOC2 HIPAA compliant limbs and other things that they already use. So the only thing that we would have is like, you know, um, de-identified information that was then also rolled up and completely abstracted away that goes to the blockchain. And so the whole right to forget side of things is we are about to embed when we do actually show donors where their samples go, we will have a kill switch within the NFT. If at any point they're like, I don't want to try this anymore. You can burn the NFT. And then worst case is you're back to the scenario we have today where the thing's totally de-identified in a random lab. Bit space and me space, meaning like the physical samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. So uh, first and foremost, via those integrations into the, the limbs and the data capture softwares and whatever else. So the, the whole sales narrative is download this app. You never mentioned crypto, obviously. So you just say download this app and um, you get all of this extra utility on the back end and you keep your endogenous workflow with the stack that you normally have. So if you de-identify a sample according to this standard here and you ship it to another lab or another biobank there, we will, yeah, and they de-identify it according to another standard, we'll still be able to keep a full picture of that provenance. Um, and that's like our go-to sales point. And they're like, oh crap, okay, we've never been able to do that because our limbs don't necessarily talk to each other. And it's a super simple thing, right? But um, integration with the limbs and then a variety of escrows and you know shipping APIs and other things just to show you where the sample is physically and then you only release it, um, once, it once it fully arrives. Close. Hey, everybody. Well, great questions. Thank you so much to the panel. Of course, quick camp for being here. Appreciate it. And I'm sure they'll be happy to answer any more questions and we'll continue with the agenda. Thank you.